you know, he's going to be Baz and old Bazza or Bazza Jazza from here on in, or it's not going to be Mr. Leaf or anything like that. It came about because I was doing a really large project um, uh, for somebody, another artist that took me down into Sydney for a week of recording. And at the end of that, that particular project, there was a song left over where uh, there was a vacancy for a, a male singer and I put Barry Leaf's name forward. As it turned out, uh, Baza was the right singer to do this particular song. So there was lots of talk between me and Baz because I did the arrangement of that particular tune. So there was a lot of phone calls and things going backwards and forwards. And then when he did record it down in Sydney, I was zoomed into the, uh, into the recording process. And at the end of it, I just went, wow, I'd forgotten how good Baz is really. I mean, uh, we did so much work together back in Sydney before I came up this way in 1990, this way being up near um, uh, Byron Bay. Lismore, and I went, I've got to do something with this old mate of mine, you know, I have to do something uh, with him, creative something or other. So I, I put it to him, do you want to see if we can forge something out of our um, longevity of long time mates and, and what we've shared in the past? And he said, yeah, it, it does interest me. So it, that's basically how it happened. And uh, boy, did it work out good, yeah. First thing I must say about that is I had only a, a small bit of the songwriting process in this particular album. I helped out now and again with uh, lyric changes and ideas for the lyrics in the tunes, because the lyrics were done with uh, Bazza and Janice Slater, who he works with, she's a lyricist. So they've got their thing going. Some of those tunes I would chime in with, I think this might be a better way to say that. So I had a few offerings like that. And then there was one moment where I said, hey Baz, it'd be great if we got a, a like a gospel sort of blues song on the album, because I love hearing um, as a singer like that, and I love playing the blues, you know, so we didn't have one. I said, um, there's a great song off Bonnie Raitt's latest album. I think it was called Blame It On Me. I said, something like that, a gospel tune in that style. And he said, okay, well, how, how should we go about it? And I said, well, what about if I write a chord progression, record it, and then you can live with it for a while and dream up a melody over the top. So I said, okay, let's try that. So I, I did that, gave it to him, and he uh, sat on it for a few weeks. And then all of a sudden in conversation, we he found the, uh, we found the, uh, the title and the direction of the tune. Because what Baz and I were talking to each other on the phone a lot, you know, to do this, and always having good fun. And at the end of one of the, uh, uh, conversations because we're you know we're we're older gentlemen now, and um, some of our friends aren't here as we on. This is what happens in life, and I said, "Oh well, Baz, um, I'm still here and you're still there," and that became the song title. You know, he went, he liked it. You know, and that that became the actual core of uh, right. There's the lyric to write something like that, but it didn't necessarily mean what. Uh, what I said to Baz, but because that, that can mean a lot of things. So it was, when he concocted the uh, lyric content and the melody, it was, a, a, you could take it quite a few ways, you know. So that's how that came about, yeah. So that was about all that I did in the way of helping with the songwriting process. So, you know, not too much from me, because, and it'll, um, it'll come up later when uh, we pursue some of the other avenues, my businesses about the contribution uh, lie kind of elsewhere in it, yeah. I tried so hard to find A way through all my days I'm really happy with the way, um, let's say, uh, I just got to get the title. Oh yeah, All Is New Again came out. That's a song by Bill Risby, 
the mighty uh, keyboard player, and his wife Natalie wrote that one. And Bazza had actually recorded it for Bill and Natalie prior. And we, Baz said, I like this tune. And I listened to it. I said, oh, yeah, it's, it's a good tune, all right. I, I think I could rearrange it. And I mean dismantle it and rearrange it, completely change it. And we need to check with Bill if he'd be okay to, for us to do that because he was going to release the song too. And he said, no, yeah, go ahead, go for it. That, that, that's, that's great because it just means there's two completely different versions of the same tune, which is, that's fine, you know. So that one in particular has a little bit more of my uh, more sort of uh, expansive fusion crossfire kind of mentality that, um, that I um, still bring to projects and things. That one had a little bit more of that. So in a way, that might be a slight favourite, that one. Okay, coming together with um, stylistically, we did talk about that because I said to Baz, because I'm going to be the arranger, I'm going to have to have a lot of freedom in the expression to do the arrangements. And we're going to morph your tunes, the more simplistic tunes that, that Baz gave me, and I'm going to really get right down into the minute of making um, something unique happen within the arrangement. So that mentality for me, and Baz liked this idea, was to actually kind of uh, caress or hit everything with a Steely Dan type mentality. That some, some of the simple chords in, the, in Baz's tunes were going to be made to be more dense and a bit more uh, unusual, perhaps. So with that in mind, we then started to look at um, reference tracks. Now this, this is something that happens a lot uh, with um, all sorts of engineers and, and um, producers the world over. We all often pull a reference track from another artist and say, this one is kind of like that, like that Bonnie Raitt tune, for example. It's a reference. That's all. It's a little, little bump along, you know, that you can keep going back to it just to see. And what happens with reference tracks when you have them, the, the track that you uh, decide to do may be headed off that way in the beginning stages, but as it wears on and more overdubs and people play on it, it starts to part company as they always do and it becomes its own thing anyway. So it's just a little inspiration moment, you know. So I turned Baz on to... Um, the David Crosby album, a 2021 album called For Free. And I said, there's a, have a listen to this album. And there's a great tune called um, Rodriguez for a Night. I really like that one. And he listened to it. He fell in love with the album. He went, I didn't know David Crosby was still doing this stuff. You know, I went, yeah, yeah. Because I keep up with a lot of like super duper keep up because I got to listen to a lot of things to be a, a good mixer and, and, and know what's going on. So uh, Baz went, wow. Okay, so that, now we can take one of the tunes and we'll, tr we'll sort of do it kind of like that. And uh, he liked that idea. So that's just like, in other words, we're massaging how to come at it together because he knew I was going to do stuff with it. And sometimes I did stuff where it was a little confrontational in the harmony. And I'd say, just live with it for a sec, Baz. You know, you, you may grow it. And usually it, it always worked out. He'd go, you know, it just took me a little while to accept the change in it. And now I love it. I said, yeah, this, this, this can happen, you know, just especially when it's new to you. So there's always a little bit of, um, I don't know if it's compromise, a little bit of push and pull, you know, but that's normal when you're making records. As a great, uh, the great engineer Al Schmidt said, every now and again, you really have to hammer it out between you and the artist, you know, that's normal. You know, but I'd have to say, working with Baz is the easiest thing in the world. We are very comfortable with each other. Well, I, I think uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, the moment where something happened early, earlier on, when, when Baz came, drove up the hill, as I call it, from Sydney to here to, to do the, uh, the vocals, 
we uh, allowed, you know, four or five days for him to, to do the main vocals here. And we, so we start recording and um, by day two, one of us would go to open our mouth to say something about what we're listening back to, to make a comment, and the other person would go, yeah, I know what you're going to say. And we'd say it for each other. And this kept happening to the point where it became a gag. We were always saying, uh, I don't have to ask you this question because I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Things like this started to happen, you know. And we kept expanding on that like musos do. We'll just like a dog with a bone, you know, we just won't let it go. And you just keep finding how many ways can we milk some humour out of this. And it just kept getting sillier and sillier. And I, I loved that moment. And, and because it's actually, it became the, the title for the, for, the, for the EP really, Who Is Who? That's, that's what that is, you know. Who is who? Because I, I say to Baz, you know, actually, I've realised that I'm you. you know? It got down to that, you know. <laughs> and vice versa. So it, it just became, it just good, silly fun. But, um, but you, you need lots of that when you're doing intense stuff. You've got to have a lot of, you've got to wrap it in, in a lot of humour. And, and I love doing that, you know, just to, I like working hard at it and then, you know, it gets a bit intense, break it with humour, calm it all down, you know, get back to it again and stuff. So Baz and I are a good fit like that. I was getting excited. This could be for real. But soon I was nervous, feeling insecure. Well, because we recorded in the uh, remote way, which to me is just like Steely Dan, the Steely Dan method of, of doing, making the albums, the ones that most of us sort of remember, like Ajar and, and albums around that sort of vintage, they weren't done with a whole band in the room together, you know, knocking the tune out and figuring out what to play. There are a lot of overdubs, and, they, and a lot of times they just take the drum part and then, re, and then build everything around the drum part, start re-recording the bass, get the bass exactly what they want. So really, the way we're doing it is just like that. And it's because of where I live, it's impractical for Barry uh, Leaf and uh, Victor Rounds to come up from Sydney to just to do a track and et cetera and so on. Brendan St. Ledger, the keyboard player on the album lives in Brisbane. He could drive down, but that's a two and a half hour drive. And, but luckily, lucky for us, Scotty Hills, this mighty drummer, lives three minutes down the road from me here. So it's easy for him to come up. But in other words, we're doing it in that sort of remote way, if you like. So the, about the improvising bit is, well, because I'm the arranger and I'm, I'm, and I'm the producer and I'm putting the tracks together, I, I have to start with something and then hand it on to the next person for them to actually put their, their bit on it. So what I've got to do is make sure that there is enough there for them to understand how this is going to turn out because they're not hearing everything at that point. So it's a careful, considered bit about who gets it next um, in the sequence of things. So when I give it to, um, say, to Victor Rounds, for example, I've already got some bass on the track that I've played and I go, might say, some of that's in the right direction but you know, you're the bass player, you're the expert, and uh, I love your playing like we all do. Feel free to usurp everything I've done on it if you come up with something better or wanna head it off in another direction, that's your business. So that you're giving the person some sort of framework, but you're allowing them to be themselves and be incredibly creative in that process. So that's important to me so that I'm not just handing stuff over to people and saying, you must play this. I don't want that. I want, the, I want the personality of the player to be infused into the tune. And so that happened with all the players. So that's the improv part would be more that. And of course, their solos. Well, they're always going to be improvised in a way. But I suppose that, that's about the best way to answer that. that. It's a loose process of, you know, what do you want me to play on this tune? I don't know. Um, Surprise me. You know, that can be said as well. Surprise me. Having said that about the remote business, because um, Scott, Scotty, Scotty Hills lives just three minutes down the road, well, went to do the drum tracks 
he do a, a demo um, track for us to build the arrangement up. He'd record that at home. But when we did the actual, um, the for real drums, he'd come and set up here in my studio and we would go hardcore getting the drum part dead right. So there's a lot of um, improvising and creative hoo-ha that, that goes on in that, I can tell you. And uh, well, anybody that hears it, you'll, you'll hear the detail in the drums. It's the, you know, everything's in its right spot and the grooves are really deep and all that sort of thing. So having the drummer close to me is the luckiest thing in all of it because there's a saying for most of us that we, almost all musicians would agree with this, drummers make or break the music. If the drummer isn't cooking, isn't grooving, doesn't matter how fancy every other thing is that sits on top of it, there's still something missing, there's something wrong with it. The drums have to be. They have the make or break of it. And Scotty's a master at playing in the studio. He's a master drummer anyway, but he's really studio savvy. And I have that working relationship with Scotty very similar to the one that I have with Baz. It's uh, very easy and creatively good fun. Cause I'm still here And you're still there Now more than ever I want you here Well, with the selecting the musicians, in a way, except for a little bit of guest spot stuff, there's a core that, 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 that came out of this because I already had a little production team for other projects that I've done here in my studio with me playing bass and guitars, uh, arranging stuff for people, recording it, mixing it and mastering it. In other words, a bit of a one-stop shop here in, in this, little, this little room. Brendan St. Ledger, the keyboard player, was part of that and Scotty Hills, the drummer, was part of that. So that means between the three of us, we had keyboards, bass, drums, and guitars covered. We added Victor into this to, to, um, to be part of it because we wanted that particular um, prowess and every, every great musical thing that he owns, we wanted him to be involved as well. So then that became a core band, if you like, and. We and I, I named that one actually. That I'm calling that. Um, we're called the Souls Syndicate. Souls Syndicate, S O U L S, because we're, it's you know we we try to be soulful in all that we do with it, and so we're just a syndicate of souls, you know, and of course there's the connotation of soul music and all that sort of thing with that. So that became the core. Then we started to look at other guests and things for um, backing vocals with Joe Elms, uh, Jade McRae on the gospel uh, track. She's an artist under us in, in her own name and right. And Jade is actually one of the backing singers that works all over the world with Joe Bonamassa. And she recorded it when she was uh, on tour, you know, in a hotel room. So we were mightily impressed with that, the, the backing vocals for um, one of the tunes. And then we had Bill Risby on his song. Well, we got him to play keyboards on it. Um, Brendan stepped down for that one. Oh, Clayton uh, Dolly played organ on, on, uh, on the gospel tune. But uh, Brendan also played keyboards on that with him. So it was just, um, I might be forgetting someone, but uh, that's kind of how it was done. With a nucleus, in other words, and then just uh, particular guests that you... Would invite in and then once somebody was invited in because we're all just doing this for the love of it you just become an honorary member of the souls syndicate you know because you've given up your time and expertise to just go i want to do it just for music itself yeah, which i love that <laughs> Well, because I've been mixing for quite a while now, I think I'm in my 10th year of mixing, um, and I, I work at it every day, I've come a long way in what could be considered to be a short time in mixing. I've come a long way because this is all I do now, is kind of what, what we're talking about with, um, with Bazza and, and other people. This is what I do. 
So I've, I've amassed some skills about mixing and I've got a particular kind of um, sound uh, that lives in my head about things uh, because I've, I've done a lot, of, um, a lot of arranging for other people. And I used to be a session guitar player in Sydney. I'm well used to studios, albeit on the other side of the glass back then, as I used to say. So I have a, a, a kind of thing that, that happens. So when I, when I start to make the tune and make the arrangement, it always comes in little waves. So I just go, oh, it's starting, it's starting to tell me what to do. I always think of it that way. I don't try and do too much to the arrangement, the tune and the texture. I just get started, which is the hardest thing really, because you're starting from nothing. In the arrangement, that is. You've got the song, but you haven't got the arrangement. I start with nothing and then just trust that I'll just do this, this, and just massage it in. Then all of a sudden, it starts to tell me what to do. That's when I like that moment, when I go, now I'm listening to the song. It's telling me what to do. I'm not telling it I'm going to do this on it. I'm going to bring this technique in. I know how to do this. I don't really think like that. I just try to relax and let the tune say, it's going here go with it. Don't fight it, go with it. So uh, that's a big one for me. And I'm very hell-bent on texture. I've got two camps, as far as a mixer goes, that live in my mind. Al Schmidt is the, one of the greatest mixers on the planet Earth who died fairly recently. And pretty much the world over, he was regarded as, for a lot of people, the number one cat, you know. Al Schmidt's whole thing was about natural sound in a way. He didn't use a lot of EQ once he'd recorded. He'd move uh, the microphone around and get the sound he wanted. So I call that, that's the natural way. I love the natural way. And if something needs to sound natural, I'll go to hell and back to put the mic in the right place and get it to be that. There's the other side of the coin where I go to a guy called like Chad Blake. It's very famous for saying, I don't want anything to sound natural. I'm corrupting everything. The bass is gonna have this on it, it's gonna be distorted. The drums are gonna have this crunch on it. This is gonna be over compressed. He's gonna use all these other things to make a different vibe happen. And I love that too. So I, I go, righto, where is it? And what can happen is there can be in a song, there can be two or three things that I leave natural and, and some other instruments around it that are corrupted, as I say. I've actually attacked them and done and slightly unnatural things to them. And that's, to me, that's me squeezing the paint. That's my painting now. I'm starting to paint the texture in by uh, desire and design. And then, of course, just skill that you, I've picked up over the years. Not up for anything really, but we would definitely like to pursue this particular one, you know, more and more. Yeah, and, and grow the Soul Syndicate. Perhaps, you know, grow it so it's got a, a good, a really good pool of people that uh, we're including in it, but keep the core spirit and, and uh, start to investigate um, more like songwriting just between Baz and I. You know, see if we can develop that more and see what we can get uh, happening with this particular particular collection of tunes. But I yes, I'm open to, if anybody comes near me that's creative and likes what I do, um, there's always some way to figure out uh, how I can help them uh, get it done. So, yeah, everyone, did you hear that? Talk to me. <laughs> when eyes no longer see The world outside the door. Oh, the thing I want to say the most about all of it is just how heartwarming it is for me to have great musicians and great mates from my uh, Sydney life when I was there, because I've been here since 1990, which is a long time now, just to have them. When I call them up and I just say, you know, it's Jim and there's, there's a project and they all just say, yeah, I, I'm in. I just love that, you know, and it's just for the, the sake of trying to create something worthwhile. That's what we're doing, trying to make the world go around in a nicer way. Uh, that's important, really important to me. 
and uh, quality music. And I think that really is the, the biggest thrill of it is that. And also watching the development of doing it in the remote way and really getting the, uh, the creative juices worked out so that there's no way in the world anyone would think that you didn't do it together, really. It sounds very cohesive. Uh, so that, that's another one of the aspects of, of doing it, this remote stuff is so that it, it doesn't sound stilted or contrived. It's got a, a sense of realness to it. So these are mighty challenges for all of us and I think uh, we're, in, we're in a good spot with it, that's for sure. And I, I, I just love all the guys and the gals dearly uh, that uh, have, uh, have taken part in this and hopefully who will take part in this. It makes a really good collective syndicate, that is. Yeah. I played a solo in that song, and I've got a lot of guitars here in the studio, and it's always about trying to find the right guitar to do what I wanted to do in that moment, okay? And uh, I tried a couple and I went, I tell you what, I'm gonna drag this one out and see whether it does it. And boy, did it do it. And this, this is the weirdest thing because, as you can see, it's a strange looking thing. This is a guitar that my son, Ben Kelly, built for his high school project. The high school in uh, Lismore here. So uh, he bequeaths it to me because he doesn't play so much anymore and he's got other instruments. And it had a really strange neck on it that I couldn't deal with, so I had an old neck lying around, so I had that fitted by a mate of mine, Jim Mills, a great um, luthier. And it's turned out to be a really interesting instrument. It shouldn't really work or do what it does, but it does it, you know. So uh, I just find that sort of interesting. In I've got a lot of expensive guitars. This, this one's probably worth about $17.50 or something, you know, in a way. <laughs> it's worth a lot to me. Yeah. So I thought that, that's just a little bit, bit of gear talk for the people with uh, guitar players out there. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Without warning, well it's the same